Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for a leap forward in medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. This month we are in beautiful Santa Clara, California for the Integrated Medicine for the Underserved Conference. All the way through the evolution of medicine, we have looked at ways to be able to bring functional and integrated medicine to more people. And this conference is taking it to the next level by looking at how we can get this medicine to the underserved. We're gonna to speak to some of the speakers, uh, some of the attendees, and we're gonna hear from some of the lectures. It's gonna be a great show, enjoy. So one of the themes of this conference is social justice, and this is not something that we've really featured on the Functional Forum before, but to give you all an idea about why we think this is so important, we sat down with Rhonda Smith, who's the Executive Director of Integrated Medicine for the Underserved, to find out why this topic and why now. Enjoy. This conference has a theme of social justice yes. and this is the first time that I've been to a medical conference with anything like that theme. So why is it important and why is it important right now? So if you uh, have been in, you know, following any of the news about healthcare, um, our healthcare, especially for the underserved, is under threat. And even for myself as uh, just an individual, I'm concerned about my ability to have access to quality care and even be insured. And so for those folks who are underserved, it's even, um, gr they're at a greater risk of um, not being able to get access to health care, period, let alone quality health care. And so for us around social justice and, and um, equity, it's important that everyone has access to quality care and whole person care and integrative health care, regardless of who they are, what they look like, where they live, how much money they make, um, or who they're friends with even. Yeah. Um, and so we're all about making sure that everyone, regardless of their, their wealth, has access to integrative health care. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most people haven't probably put those two things together, but why is the integrative component so important in this conversation? Well, because, um, you know, when you look at um, prevention and then you look at chronic diseases and the rate of chronic diseases within this country, though they're mostly preventable. And so we have evidence that um, demonstrates that integrative health care and whole person care and not just relying solely on pharmacological solutions can be a great um, solution and very efficacious when it comes to disease prevention as well as um, disease maintenance and, and preventing diseases from uh, getting worse that people um, deal with. Yeah, as you put this conference together, I know it's grown significantly this yes. year. Is there a certain reason you think for the uptick in interest in serving this yeah. group? Um, so in terms of new people, yes, we have about 65% um, of the conference registrants are first timers, so that's great. We actually made a concerted effort this year to do more outreach than we have in the past so that we could you know, grow and expand our community and engage folks who maybe otherwise wouldn't know about integrative medicine for the underserved and definitely not about the conference. So we wanted to make sure that you know, we as an organization um, continue to grow our community and embrace and engage those who are of the same mindset and uh, passion for serving the underserved. So what are some of the topics that you're excited about that are, that are coming up uh, this weekend? Yeah, so we have a panel discussion with Dr. Tolbert Small, who is, um, or I should say, was the physician to the Black Panther Party back in the day. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we have Elizabeth Markle, who um, will be speaking um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, and then we have a film showing tomorrow night about um, refugees and the impact um, around health equity for those who are somewhat forgotten about or overlooked and definitely um, 
uh, subject to a lot of injustice these days. So uh, one of the topics, and the reason, honestly, why I'm here is yeah. because I'm just so uh, excited about group visits. Mm -hmm. I really feel like this might be the way that everyone can have access to integrative functional medicine. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, uh, that topic generally, and, and what's it been like to sort of bring together those yeah. leaders here? Yeah, so I'm happy to have Jeff Geller, who's been a longtime board member and sort of part of I Am For Us from the very beginning. Um, here talking about group visits and um, group visits has, you know, at least in my experience, has proven to be a way to not only um, enable the underserved patients to get access to integrative health care, but also for the clinics and providers who care for the underserved, it's giving them a way to actually be able to um, get reimbursed for those services. So it's a win-win, win for everybody. It's productive and um, helpful and effective for the patients. It's also that way for the clinics and also the, provi the providers who care for those patients. Well, look, it's such an important and powerful conversation. Thank you so much for leading in this area. Yeah. And we hope that everyone watching at home will uh, you know, be a little bit more interested in these communities. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jerry Fusilier, and I am a member of Open Source Wellness. I joined Open Source Wellness because of things I had in my life that were very personal, but Open Source Wellness helped me to not be embarrassed about being vulnerable. And so I said that to say this is that uh, since I've been at Open Source Wellness, I've learned a lot and I continue to learn from people. I continue to trust people where at one time I didn't trust anybody, but Open Source Wellness helped me with that. And whatever I can do to give back, I will. I'm not embarrassed anymore. I'm not scared to be vulnerable. It's really helped me. Hi, my name is Anna Ascari. Um, I'm a family medicine resident at uh, Eisenhower Health in the Palm Springs, California area. And um, something that I've learned new about uh, integrative medicine from this conference is the magic of group medical visits um, for the underserved community in particular. And so something that I'd like to incorporate into my future practice after residency. So I first heard about this conference through Dr. Jeffrey Geller when I sat down with him earlier this year to record our podcast as part of this group visit series. And he's been teaching the integrative group visit model and his empowerment model at this conference for the last nine years. And we sat down with him to find out about what makes him and group visits tick. All right, we are here with Dr. Jeffrey Geller. He has just uh, finished the workshop on supporting social justice with group visits. Really, really interesting and great to, to finally meet you. You know, over the last five years that we've been advocating for group visits, your name has come up so many times as, uh, you know, some people came and got their training at this conference and then have gone out into the world and, and taken it um, wherever they've taken it. So, uh, you know, your talk was on social justice and I know that's a big part of sort of how you, how you came into this. So. You know, for those people who don't know the story, uh, how did you end up starting group visits and what is the population that you're working with? So I, I started off taking care of uh, patients who uh, seemed lonely um, and uh, loneliness is really my entryway into to the group visits. Um, what I didn't realize is that people were also having a lot of the factors of the social determinants of health. I was also working in a poor community, one of the poorest in New England. And so um, in trying to figure out the way to reduce loneliness and make people feel happier, healthier, and find meaning in their lives, uh, that's how I entered into group visits. Um, it just seemed a natural way to reduce loneliness by bringing people together. Beautiful. So the, you've got, you know, you've got pe bringing people together. What are you going to do in that time? And what I noticed today is that you're the facilitator, but you're not necessarily in charge of what happens in the group. How do you do, how do you sort of, um, learn to do that as someone maybe as a doctor who's used to being in charge. Yeah, well, you know, you're, you're covering things that aren't in your regular training. You're learning um, what's the best thing in the community, and then you realize, wait a minute, I live in a community, you know, a couple towns over. Huh, what's it like being a, uh, a, a Latino with the social injustice, with racism? I'm not. I don't have necessarily the background to know what all the problems are, but I have the heart that wants to help and I have a medical background that can help with the medical side of things. Mm. 
And so as I um, think about you know, how to reduce um, suffering, you need the input of the people who are suffering to, uh, to tell you what directions you need to go. You know, we've heard a lot of different types of group visits, and I know that you're in favor of groups that continue on forever. And um, so can you just tell us a little bit about why you think that that's the way to do it and what your experience has been with groups ongoing? And, and particularly, like, what happens after, you know, maybe you've had the first 10, 20 visits and they maybe don't have the medical condition that they came in with? Yeah, well, you know, it's beautiful to see people get healthier. But usually the suffering that the group visits take care of is the loneliness, depression, social isolation. And so if a group ends, then you're back to where you were with those problems. And so it's not in going to a group every week or every day that's healing. It's in the knowledge that there's someone there for you if you really need them. And so when I say the groups go on forever, people graduate. People with diabetes learn how to control their diabetes. You know, people in pregnancy deliver their babies, right? Mm -hmm. Life goes on and you don't always need the group, but it's really nice to feel like you have a home, a medical home where if something comes up, you know a doctor really well. You know a com community of people you can call on who can help you that are friends. And so that's really what I mean by it goes on forever. You know, you're a member of your family. You don't say, I'm just gonna be a member of this family for a year. Yeah. You know, you're, you're part of the family. And sometimes they're falling outs and sometimes there are issues in families, but um, you know, I think the real goal is to just make someone feel so special, so important, and so invested that they want to be part of a community. And if it's a health healing community, when they get well, then they help others. Absolutely. What have you seen as the sort of typical, you know, endpoints? Like you've run groups, I know, that have run for 20 years. What does a group like that start out looking like? And what does it look like, you know, five, 10 years later? Yeah, so many examples um, for me to think about. Uh, we had one group for people who had uh, intellectual disability and uh, some de developmental delay. Mm -hmm. And they would meet with me twice a week uh, at the health center and we would do our empowerment model, mm -hmm. you know, figure out what the problems were with health in their community and obesity. And we kind of figured out there wasn't enough exercise, there was probably too much soda drinking. And we uh, eventually talked to their day program. The day program started doing the same programs that I was doing in the health center and they were doing it daily, and they started empowering uh, those individuals. So they didn't need to come to me anymore. The community had gotten better for them. Yeah. You know? So that's like a beautiful story. For an individual, you know, someone who's a smoker and they quit smoking, um, it's sometimes useful just to know that you could go back if you needed it. You know? So you've quit smoking, you're no longer part of the smoking cessation group, but you know, like I've told you, hey, if you ever feeling like you might smoke again, just come right back, yeah. right? So you kind of know you have the ability to rejoin. And then there are other groups where you just get better, you know? So we've had many people in our obesity groups where, you know, my goal isn't to have people lose a ton of weight, it's just to be healthy, be yeah. happy, right? Yeah. But you have people who figure out, you know, I can do this at a YMCA or I can do this at a workout world or, you know, I've developed some friends I can go walking around the block with. And so, I don't really need to do that at the health center because I'm now self-efficacious. I can do this on my own. And to me, that's another beautiful way to, to get better. So we're there if you need us. If you don't need us, um, that's great. That's even better. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, you know, when, when someone's gone through these processes and there's a desire then to maybe you know, help others on that journey, how have you found ways to, to, to put people in sort of more of a leadership position in front of other people to, to allow them to express that? Yeah, well, it's kind of a beautiful thing. You know, there's a natural progression of people in groups. And um, I would say there's, you know, it's not everybody, but sometimes there's someone who learns how to be healthy and they get so excited about that that they want to help others. Yeah. And so we allow them to still come to the groups. And when a new person comes, it, it probably feels a lot better for them to hear, hey, I used to be that way. Mm. This is what I did. You can do it too you know, and impart that ad advice. You know, we definitely have people in our exercise groups who can lead an exercise class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have people who can lead meditation. Uh, if I'm not there and, and, and everyone is sick, but all the people in the group are still there, especially a group that's existed for five, 10 years, yeah. they still talk. They still kind of hold, hold the group, so they've learned a lot of skills. And uh, you can only do that if you have people who continue to come after they've improved their health. You know, you don't want just the unhealthy people. You want to take care of everybody. 
Yeah. Yeah, how do you, uh, how do you stop groups sort of um, from going down a direction of being a sort of mutually disempowering group to the, imp the what are the fundamentals of the empowerment model? Uh, so there are really two parts to it. One is constantly trying new things, uh, and the other is building relationships. And so there are some reasons that some people cannot build relationships. Some are uh, medical, some are social, um, but uh, by and large, people can build working relationships and be with each other. Uh, as far as trying new things, I think once you've tried it all, uh, you know, which can happen after, we've had some groups that are for 20 years, and those groups generally come up with, you know, we'll do exercise, we'll be an exercise group. Yeah. You know, because we've cooked everything, we've talked about all the medicines, we've, you know, talked about everything, about social life. So they just need to get together, get socially connected, re reduce the loneliness, the depression, the anxiety, the stress, yeah. you know, and just unload and be with, with people. And, you know, you, you do need medical care, and so I'm there to help in those groups too. You know, whether it's just giving flu shots or, or something that's no longer as severe as, uh, as when they were in more dire ill straits. You know, you, uh, you're obviously teaching here at Integrated Medicine for the Underserved, but I know that you also have a functional medicine group visit model. Mm -hmm. um, what is that specific model and how do you sort of differentiate the two in the minds of your community? Well, in our community, the functional group is more about food um, exercise, sleeping patterns. So it's people who don't want to use medications and they're really interested in finding ways to avoid that. Uh, we don't do the full-on functional medicine analysis with blood tests and things that uh, would be even more helpful in discerning you know, what's going on with someone. Uh, but we try and get the low-hanging fruit. Um, and uh, by and large, that requires a lot of support. You know, one thing that we do a little different is in functional medicine, usually there's a one-on-one -on -one assessment that might take an hour initially, and that's wonderful. But in the healthcare model I work in, it, it wasn't cost effective. So instead we take little nibbles. You know, we see people once a month, every two weeks, and we just you know, find out a little bit about their past history, find out what they're eating, find out about their social history, exposures to toxins. And we just, uh, as we're finding that history, we're also adding you know, healthy lifestyle um, components and uh, not everyone ends up perfect you know some people just started really low and ended up somewhere in the middle yep. some people start in the middle end up really high you know but at a minimum they're feeling supported and, and I know a big one of the basis of functional medicine is reducing stress you know lowering those cortisol hormones and, and just being with others does that naturally uh, I know you know you've probably done more group visits than sort of anyone in the space. I know at one point you were doing fifty a week at, the, at that stage. Is that about right? It is. Well, I wasn't doing all of them. Okay. You know, I, I had fellows and various people. Um, and it depends how you count. You could say that there were over a hundred groups uh, at a time. But but when I talk about a week, you know, it meant that we had forty five hours a week of programming at one site, and yeah. we had five hours of programming at another site. Wow. And um, you know, that, I don't know of anyone who, who has ever had more than that. You know, the goal, though, is really uh, matching the needs of your community with the services they need. And, and uh, um, you know, how do you count groups? You know, we have an acupuncture group every Monday. Yeah. So each month, is it four acupuncture groups because it's a different group each Monday? Yeah. Or each week there's only one. You know, so you can get into very high exponential numbers of how many groups there have been. So I know recently you've had the chance to sort of uh, set your practice model from scratch, right? Yes. And say, okay, I've been doing this for two decades. What should this look like if I got to call the shots? So I'd love to just, you know, hear how you're setting up your practice now and who you're serving and, um, and why you've decided to set it up the way you have. Yeah, so I'm changing my practice slightly from being a group visit provider in a large, um, federally qualified community health center where we had maybe 40, 50,000 patients, mm. and I would be refer, you know, people would refer a patient for chronic pain to come to a chronic pain group or come to an acupuncture group or uh, insomnia group to really taking care of my own primary care patients in, in a certain uh, setting. And so when I do that, it actually gets a lot easier because I know all of my patients very well. And so I, I think of how you get the clinic and the group space really connected. So I, I've got a Taekwondo studio that uh, abuts the new clinic. We'll cut a door into it, and boom, we have a group space. Um, 
Uh, by and large, we've learned that we can have two concomitant groups. Three isn't so easy. So we used to have a room that divided into three. Mm. We're now making a, a lar slightly larger room, but it divides into two. Uh, we have a place that has a lot of windows. Our, our old place didn't have that, better air circulation. Mm. You know, so from a, fi a physical space, yeah. you know, we're, we have a place that's going to be a lot more uh, functional um, in terms of also holding conferences. So we're going to be a teaching facility, teaching people how to do group visits. We're, we're going to have fellows. We're going to be offering you know, shadowing opportunities. And so we're also building that in with kind of how the windows are, are set and kind of how the flow of patients uh, can operate. So you know, separate entrance ways and things like that. So you, I know you've been doing this for, for more than 20 years. Do you feel any energetic shift in, in the last little while as to uh, people really starting to get the potential of the group visit movement to you know, not only solve isolation and, and loneliness really, but also to deliver functional integrated medicine principles to you know, a population that hasn't really had access to it? Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of fear and hesitancy among administrators. Some people don't believe in the financial model, not in terms of, you know, it's a very good financial model in terms of number of patients you see per hour, but kind of the legitimacy of it. So I constantly hear arguments that will diminish all the evidence which shows, wow, this is a better way to provide care. You know, there are better health outcomes. It's cheaper to provide care this way. Uh, one doctor can take care of more patients. Patients are getting services to overcome. So almost all the evidence is in favor of group visits. So I always feel like, wow, that, that latest study, that shows it, you know, yeah. this is gonna be amazing. And then I, I think there's just these hypothetical fears of getting rid of the old way. You know, yeah. and probably some of it is in physician groups and lobbyist groups, and some of it is in the insurance companies. But what I think is a huge shift is that the cost savings from doing group visits is becoming more and more apparent. And I feel that it, it's going to push us towards a capitated uh, healthcare system where we're paying to reduce illness as opposed to right now you get more money if someone's sick, right? Yep. If I have a patient who's sick and they come eight times, I earn eight times more than a patient who's well. Yeah. So, so let, let us physicians uh, have some money for keeping people well. <laughs> Group visits will thrive in that environment because that's what they do. They keep people well. They prevent injury. You know, and, and they're really low cost. So let's just say, you know, people start to get it en masse, and now suddenly everyone realizes, okay, we do need a layer of care between, you know, just society and the medical system, and, and we think groups can do that. How do you think that, you know, we could most effectively, like, scale up the delivery of this care? Because I know that that's something that I think about. It's like, I re I'm convinced that this is where it needs to go, but then I think, okay, how do we get there? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy. You know, I, I think, you know, depart I, I've done things where I've had group visits in YMCAs, YWCAs, um, libraries, uh, uh, hospitals, you know. So needing space is sometimes like, whoa, our, our health center doesn't have a space to, to meet. So I think you just need some, some regulations that allow you to call these atypical spaces, medical places where you can bill, you know. And I think aside from that, it would be very easy to implement um, these programs. You know, I, I think we mainly need providers who are trained in facilitative practices. You know, at the Integrated Center for Group Medical Visits, we're offering trainings. I know um, uh, uh, Centering Health Institute is offering trainings. Um, I don't know of many other people who are, right? So, um, you know, the scaling up of those curriculums. I'm walking, working with Paula Gardner at UMass uh, Medical Center right now, and we're working on an online curriculum that, uh, you know, the idea is to keep it low cost and, and make these things accessible so that when that moment happens, yeah. you know, people can learn how to do the groups. And, uh, you know, what you're doing helps as well, you know, kind of documenting where we are and, and what sort of practices work. Absolutely. Yeah, well, look, I, I, you know, having been part of it and seen it in real time and, and also, you know, interviewed so many people now, I see, you know, the potential for the groups to solve many different problems in healthcare. You know, we've seen in the functional medicine world, particularly as an example, you know, what are the most inefficient parts of the functional medicine operating system, right? The long intake, um, labs and lab reviews and those kind of things where, uh, so where, where practitioners have just said, okay, we're gonna do all lab reviews in a group because guess what? You know, you learning from someone else's results help you understand yourself better even if it's not your results. 
or on the intake, you know, the intaking process, it, you know, is something that I learn from other people's questions too. So it's, to me, it's really exciting seeing just the power of group and how it could work in all different ways. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm just super excited to see, uh, you know, how we can get more and more people uh, on board uh, with, the, with the idea. So uh, if you haven't listened to the podcast I did with Dr. Geller at the beginning of this group visit series, make sure to go and check it out. We all have details in the show notes of where you can come for upcoming training in group visits. But Doc, thanks so much yeah. uh, for everything that you've done to, you know, to bring this up until now. And, and I hope that uh, a bigger uh, team is coming together to push this, uh, push this more and more uh, forward. And it's an exciting time to be in group visits. And yeah, James, thanks for your work and thanks for uh, highlighting what group visits can do. Really Thank appreciate you. it. All right, super excited to be here at IM4S with Dr. Misha Kogan. You may know from the series that we did a podcast earlier this year on group visits. Doc, um, some real energy here this year. Love it. It's great. It's pretty large and just, you know, my people. So it's, it's good to be here. Yeah, so uh, what are some of the things that you've learned this weekend? Um, well, I, I missed yesterday, but, you know, sounds like it's, everything's about groups, but the level of engagement and conversations is moving towards much more practical much more not only just sort of how do we start this but now how do we research this how do we move inside institutions i mean it's very exciting time of transition from like oh who knows about this oh you now to like well everybody knows about it now how do we expand this and make it really global so this is a this is a almost like now baby is becoming moving out of the toddler stage into like pre-teenage years so i think it's very it's very so the energy is according it's a little chaotic but it's up rapidly continues to grow yeah they we were in that uh group visit session earlier where they're talking about the evidence base what struck you struck you about that that certain organizations like nih are starting to create a whole separate methodology how to do the research i actually didn't even know about that so you know <clears throat> it's a separate evidence that methodology around evidence should be built and and the amount of studies that are coming out doubling every couple of years now we're talking about creating a whole separate subsection of evidence on how to do a good studies on groups you know that that i'm not a researcher i'm a clinician but it means also that probably we're going to start seeing more researchers coming to us clinicians saying work with us which I've already experienced that in my own institution at George Washington University, and I hope we're going to see more of it. All right. One of the reasons I love coming to these conferences is to meet the people you've only ever met on Zoom before. Yeah, so, Doc, yeah. keep up the great That's work. Awesome. And uh, always great to see leaders in the space of integrated medicine for the underserved. Check out the next segment. So if you've been following along on the emails, you know that we are putting more and more resources into making it easy for you to continue to build meetups all across the world around the functional medicine community. Uh, to that end, we have brought on to the team Kristen Brokaw, who is 2019 Community Builder of the Year. She is the creator of SLIM, the St. Louis Institute for Integrated Medicine, the most successful ongoing meetup around the country. And so on the third Wednesday of every month, we are going to be offering webinars and trainings and education to help you grow and help your meetup thrive. So go to meetup.functionalforum.com and you can get all the resources on how to get on that webinar. Hi, my name is Rhonda Coleman. I am at the Integrative Medicine for Underserved Conference, the ninth annual conference. This weekend I spoke about capoeira and how to use it as a tool for dealing with stress and for focusing on breathing. And it received an awesome response. We talked about the importance of community and how music and togetherness can bring people to a, a place of mindfulness and relaxation in stressful times. Hi, I am Mary Purdy. I am an integrative and functional medicine dietitian, and I love working with people around their diet, especially when people don't have access to food, which can be for a variety of reasons, including policy, poverty, racism, climate change, all of the above. But we as dietitians can take hold of this issue, and if People don't have access to healthy food. We can work with them in so many other ways. We can talk about mindful eating practices. We can talk about how sleep and stress affect food choices and how food choices affect sleep and stress. We can talk about 
and convene with them around what the relationship is to food and identify cultural practices that connect them to food and to their community. There's so much that we as dietitians can do to help people who are underserved, who may not have access to healthy food, but who can still have an amazing relationship with food that will help them to have a more well-balanced life and a healthier body. So what does the most successful group visit model look like in America today? It's called Centering Pregnancy, and we sat down with Marina Burnett, who is on the team that is scaling that out to the masses. Super interesting topic. Enjoy. All right, we are here at Integrated Medicine for the Underserved, and we're here with Marina Burnett. She is the Senior Director of Engagement and Innovation at Centering Healthcare Institute. And that is the group that is responsible for Centering Pregnancy, which I believe is the most successful sort of group visit structure that we have in healthcare. So let's get into that a little bit. I'd love to know just, um, just a little bit about the history of how this first uh, came about and um, sort of like the journey from, from there to here. It's really a lovely beginning. It was started out of Yale by a brilliant midwife, Sharon Schindler Rising, who recognized that she wasn't delivering care in the way that she wanted to. She will tell the story that she spent many uh, times throughout her day saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry that she didn't have enough time with her patients that her schedule was getting backed up when she was spending that little bit of extra time. Sorry that she didn't really get to dive deeper into the topics that she knew could, that could make a difference. And so she came up with an idea more than 25 years ago. Let's bring women together in a circle and have them spend time with one another, with her as a healthcare provider, and, and to be able to ask their questions and talk about the things that mattered most to them. And so Centering was born um, and grew somewhat organically. It was a grassroots movement. Yeah. Sharon was a midwife. She told some of her friends what she was doing. They heard about it. People started um, hearing about it um, when they were in their residency programs. And it just sort of took off yeah. over, over time. Um, today, there are over 600 practices across the U.S. who wow. are doing centering. And it serves about 70,000 patients each year. Wow, it's amazing. I know uh, infant mortality is a big problem in America. The numbers are, are really high for a nation of our developments. Um, what has been the result on that? And what are, you know, what are the sort of the broader uh, results and outcomes of centering pregnancy? A number of studies have demonstrated a reduced risk of preterm birth from 33 to 47% wow. compared with the US rate. We're seeing uh, low birth weights are um, increasing. We're seeing breastfeeding is um, higher rates of initiation and extended breastfeeding. We're seeing better attendance for visits. Uh, patients reporting that they're feeling um, better prepared for both the birth and uh, to be a parent afterwards. Um, I love a, a story that uh, an administrator of a large hospital in Philadelphia shared once that you could always tell who the centering patients were. Um, they were the people that were most prepared, who knew what questions to ask, weren't afraid to ask the questions, and when things weren't going quite the right way, to push back a little bit and say, how can we fix this? So more collaborative in their care. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, we're here is talking about social justice in the context of, of healthcare. Um, can you share just your uh, experience on what role, you know, the integrated medicine through Centering Pregnancy is, is having um, on, on that end? So one of the things that several studies have demonstrated is a flattening of racial disparities um, in the preterm birth rate for uh, black women versus white women. And um, we can certainly point to the studies. But I think a provider that I worked with recently said it really best when she said, if you're a patient 
and you have a one-on-one -on -one experience with a provider, sometimes you don't have the same level of trust with that provider, particularly if they don't share your lived experience. Mm -hmm. But there's great comfort to come into a group and see people that might look like you, people that might live in your neighborhood, people who share your lived experience. And so there is a, a sense of trust and belonging that can occur in a group experience that you don't see in traditional care. Amazing. And um, what would it take to, for this to go from something that's for 70,000 people to being the standard of care for pregnancy in America? That's a great question. Uh, we have um, attracted the attention of a number of very generous um, philanthropists who have invested in our organization. And we have a very aggressive growth plan uh, for a multi-year growth plan. And part of it is um, tied to what we call the continuity model, the P to two, which is prenatal care through the second birthday. So it's centering pregnancy and centering parenting. We know that this is the greatest period of, of health and, and development. Yeah. And so some of this funding is allowing us to scale and make centering uh, accessible, particularly in the communities across the country where we know we can have the greatest impact. Amazing. So you're in charge of innovation. What do you see as, as innovative in the product right now? And where do you see innovation going in the future? So we've recently um, expanded some of our uh, resources to beyond pregnancy and parenting to um, provide some tools and resources for providers who want to apply the centering methodology to other health conditions. Okay. So we're seeing diabetes groups and hypertension groups and autoimmune conditions and lifestyle groups. Mm. And so Basically, using the centering methodology, you can go across the life course from prenatal care through early pediatrics to other chronic conditions. So that's one thing that's really exciting. And we're continually striving to find ways to make it more accessible to people. Um, and so we're looking at some different approaches for our facilitation training so that um, low resourced um, clinics can still be able to send their staff to our trainings, um, doing some work with uh, e-learning and in virtual um, delivery of, of training. And what, what's the range of uh, sort of medical facilities that are delivering this? Is it private practice? Is it hospitals? Is it everything? Centering is in just about every type of healthcare setting across the US. So we're in private practice, we're in large academic medical centers. Uh, we are in um, Indian Health Services. Uh, we are in the military. The US Army has stated that centering pregnancy is their standard of care. It's going to be their standard of care. Um, we as an organization are particularly focused on federally qualified health centers and community health centers. Again, because we know that those are the communities where it has been demonstrated that centering can have the greatest impact. You know, you mentioned your, your talk a little earlier today, talk about this transition to value-based care. Yes. Um, what do you see as the, you know, how do you see that centering uh, can, can play into that transition? I think we're well positioned uh, for value-based care um, and we're seeing some really exciting things happening. It started in South Carolina um, with um, enhanced reimbursement for Medicaid. We're seeing other states starting to uh, move into that as well. Just a week or so ago, New Jersey um, signed a new law for um, reimbursement for specifically for centering care. Um, so we're, we're hearing it's happening in a number of states. We're part of the conversation um, and helping to, to drive that. I think Ohio may be next. Is there any way to get one of the big democratic political candidates behind it and talk about it from stage as like a, you know, a deal breaker or something that an innovation that they want to spread it to everywhere, make it, you know, in Medicare for all? Or is that, you know, it seems like that could be a, a big potential platform next year. 
Absolutely. Do you know of anyone that, <laughs> that you have that connection Let me just for text us? Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it just seems like, uh, you know, the group visit model is something that, you know, could be something that if it was understood by the community would be something that you know people uh could could really get behind i agree yeah especially if uh, you know we're paying so much for healthcare. here's a way to mm -hmm. really really reduce the cost okay so if we have people that are watching the show what's the best way to get in touch if you are interested in in bringing centering into uh either your private practice or into a bigger bigger institution so our website is centeringhealthcare.org. Uh, we are a small nonprofit based in Boston. Um, I think our website has some interesting information to give people a, a little bit of a background. Um, we have a staff in Boston. We're starting to build out some regional staff as well. Um, again, in the in communities where we know there's a great need. So we're currently in the Southwest and in the Midwest. Um, we also one thing if I can can talk about um, again through some very generous philanthropy, we have been offering. Uh, implementation awards to federally qualified health centers and community health centers um, that are eager to start um, the centering uh, parenting model. Okay. Um, and that might be in conjunction with pregnancy. Maybe they already have centering pregnancy and they're looking to expand. Or potentially they're just looking to start centering parenting because they know that the potential impact that can have over the life course. So the implementation awards um, provide um, support and the consulting support and the training that I talked about. It's all in kind services that can help a practice to um, make that transition. And Absolutely. Uh, what about the uh, the providers that you train? So, what's the typical process that they go through to get trained? What is the range of providers that, and practitioners that can get trained, mm -hmm. and uh, what do you hear from them once they start doing this in the field? So, every centering group is facilitated by two people. One is the billing provider um, because it is a, a a billable healthcare visit. And then the second could be a variety of different roles. It could be a communi community navigator. It could be um, a patient advocate, a medical assistant, a nurse. Um, we require everybody who does facilitate groups to go through a two-day uh, basic facilitation training. Okay. Uh, we know that strong facilitation is one of the reasons people come back to the group and just the opposite of, of that is true. So it's really important that they learn some of the basics of good facilitation because it's really quite different, particularly for the providers, it's really quite different than the way they can deliver information in a 10 minute visit where it's very didactic and they're just trying to share information. Yeah. There's no recognition if anything's being received or, or understood. But in a two-hour format, um, in a facilitated model, um, there's discussion, there's interactive uh, learning opportunities, there's that peer support and a community builds. And it takes skill to be able to uh, facilitate that type of a, a group visit. So that's what the two day is all about. And we see usually mid morning on the second day, little aha moments happening amongst the, the participants in that training when they're starting to really understand how it can make a difference in the way that information can be delivered um, and people are able to participate more fully in their own care. Yeah. Um, and then we hear back from providers all the time uh, about how it has changed, not only how they are with their patients in the center and group, but the way that they engage with patients in traditional care as well. Absolutely. Well, look, I wish you all the success on the, on the aggressive timeline that you have to, to grow this. And uh, it seems like, you know, I guess one, one question is, have is it seems to me that one of the reasons why this has been so successful is because women at the moment they get pregnant are ready to sort of um, are ready to learn in a way that maybe people mm -hmm. who 
might have a chronic disease don't want to learn. They mm -hmm. just want it to be taken care of. The doctor, mm -hmm. is, there, is there something special about the timing of this particular thing that just has made it click? That's an interesting question. I think the course of pregnancy and the first couple of years of a child's life are a time when people are more open to learning and to behavior change. Yeah. And so this is a good opportunity um, for that as well. But interestingly, in, in some of the other health conditions that we've seen, um, there's been great acceptance as well because you recognize you're not alone in your experience yeah. and others have the same questions that you have. Sometimes someone else in the group asks a question that you may not have even thought about, but it's really relevant um, to you as well. Um, so that can can change the way that you understand your health condition. Yeah. And, and part of the centering model is to empower the patients when they they come in, they do their um, self-assessment. Yep. Um, and again, it gives them more information about their health to allow them to make better decisions about their health. And, and we see that also carry on to other areas of their life as well. Absolutely. I know before this, you, you worked in a functional medicine office. Yes. And so you're very familiar with that yes. um, operating system. Obviously, this is an integrated medicine conference. Are there, what, what does centering offer from an integrative and functional viewpoint in the services? And do you see potential for more innovation in that direction? Absolutely. So the benefit of a two-hour visit versus, again, 10 or 15 minute, enables you to layer other interventions within yeah. that healthcare visit. So behavioral health is a great example of that, where you could have maybe the second facilitator is, is someone from behavioral health, and they're a part of the group. They're someone who's familiar the patients have a relationship with them, so it's a warm handoff if, if further care is required. Uh, we've seen some incredible um, partnerships across the country where uh, the clinic is, is bringing in representatives from the local food bank mm -hmm. that are coming in and actually providing food for the centering uh, patients. We've seen um, Reach Out and Read uh, implemented within the centering visit in a way that's really different than occurs in the traditional well child um, visit. So you have just, there's just a variety of different examples of, of where you can bring in um, experts from, from the clinic or from the, the uh, community that can support that patient population. Absolutely. Well, it's been great to be here with uh, Marina Burnett from uh, the Centering Healthcare Organization, and we're super excited to have you here. If you go to uh, centeringhealthcare.org, you can find out more about their opportunities. Thank you so much for, for being part of it, and we wish you the best of luck. Hi, I'm Armite Austin, and I'm a faculty educator with teaching medical students and residents in family medicine and integrative medicine. My take home point here is this is an eclectic and a very interesting group, and my passion uh, con coincides with the mission, which is serving the underserved people. I'd highly recommend. Uh, physicians and practitioners to be involved in education to teach future doctors for integrative medicine as well as uh, a commitment to give and serve the underserved. So my take home points was the great education and the community service that we can provide for our patients. Right, so if you've been following the Functional Forum for the last few months, you know that our new sponsor is the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. And the reason why we decided to go into a long-term sponsor partnership with them is because they are doing something that no one else is doing. They have created the group visit toolkits to make it easy for you to run a group visit. And excitingly enough, they have a group visit for chronic pain. It's called No Pain, Total Gain. It was created by Dr. Shilpa Saxena. And inside of this, there's all the resources you need in order to run 
on a group visit. There's soap notes, resources, PowerPoints, intake forms, billing things. And they also have a whole team there to support you if you have questions. So go to goevomed.com slash GVT. You can find out more about the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center and you can make it super easy for you to start your first chronic pain group visit with these resources. Go visit it. Let us know how you got on. So our next interview is with Dr. Chanel Heerman, an integrative psychiatrist who has been innovating on the cross-section of group visits and telemedicine for over a decade. Now, one of the reasons why I'm super excited to have her here on the forum is because she has been a member of our Practice Accelerator for the last three years, right since the beginning. And in our Practice Accelerator, we have literally brought together the most innovative clinicians looking to build the practices of the future. So as you listen to Dr. Heerman, think about that innovation and we would love for you to join us in our Practice Accelerator. We are opening the doors twice a year and so this month in September we are taking a new enrollment of practitioners looking to build successful innovative practices of the future. In that Practice Accelerator earlier this year we did a whole series on virtual group visits and we have some innovators in our Practice Accelerator actually starting virtual group visit structures and looking to see how we can take advantage of the power of group using virtual strategies. This is a cutting edge area but it's something I'm super excited about so if you're inspired by Dr. Chanel go to goevomed.com slash accelerator find out more about the program we'd love to have you join. All right, I'm super excited to be here with Dr. Chanel Heerman. She is an integrative psychiatrist, a virtual group visit leader, and a member of our practice accelerator for, you know, pretty much since the beginning. So, you know, there's a lot of people asking me, hey, group visits, we love the idea. Is there a way that we can do these online? And I know this is something that you've been doing for a long time. How did you sort of get into this the first time? Um, I've been doing group work for a really long time. I actually did um, the Center for Mind Body Medicine's training program yep. when I was a fourth year med student. So oh. that was my basic science elective because I had a really nice advisor at the University of Nebraska. Got to plug the yeah. alma mater. And um, so I got to go do this awesome mind body thing. And then I spent the next number of years just looking for excuses to do these group programs mm -hmm. um, because I loved it. I just fell in love with it. And I've been doing it on and off for a bunch of years. Um, had an opportunity to get certified when I was working for the VA um, some years back, and and then I started working telemedicine. It's uh, one of those weird things how life just sort of happens. I hadn't set out to be a telemedicine expert, but I was a single mom of a five-year-old and working home was as good yeah. as it gets, and, <laughs> and so I wound up doing that, and I missed my groups. So. Um, so they just sort of came together that way and I started uh, begging and pleading administrators at the places where I was working to please let me do some groups over video and if you ask enough people eventually they let you do it. Amazing. So <laughs> I know that you, you mentioned today there's some like different ways to mm -hmm. do the groups, right? So you want to just tell us the sort of different ways that you've done it and what you found to be, you know, what works the best? Um, you can either do them where all of the people, all of the patients, participants, come to a place, like sit around a table, perhaps with a co-facilitator, perhaps not, um, and then you come in on the video, um, or you can have all the people together, sort of like a, a video conference meeting where everybody's in their own home or office, mm -hmm. and you do the session that way. And there's probably pros and cons for each one. It depends a little bit on how you're planning on billing it. It depends a little bit on the support structure you have. Um, depends a little bit on your patient population and how tech savvy they are, how much access do you have for IT help if they're going to be doing it from home, whether you need um, based on your particular billing needs to have yeah vital signs or someone available in the building, that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of rules. Yeah, absolutely. So you're a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I've seen that you have sort of like a coursework that you take people through in these groups yes. that's not necessarily psychiatric based, right? It's more based on health creation? I would say so, yeah. yeah. Um, basically, I, I eventually took um, the base of the Center for Mind Body Medicine model and threw in a couple of other things that I like. Um, there's a session on, on nonviolent communication. There's another session with some stuff I learned um, at the positive psychology course that Tal Ben-Shahar teaches and kind of mushed it all together into my own thing, which is the Seven um, Foundations of Health and Happiness, which I wrote a little book about and yeah. um, have been doing that. And we actually published a little study on that using it in a rural population at a community mental health center. 
Yeah. And uh, you know, spoiler alert, it went really well. The patients really liked it, and we had a great time. Yeah. So how do you how did you uh, go about sort of collecting outcomes for that kind of work, and and do you hope that that could you know, happen more often? And, and what would it take for someone to sort of replicate the work there? I think it's important that we get data for the stuff we're doing, even if it's something really simple. I mean, a lot of what we did was there is a this thing called the Arizona Integrative Outcome Scale that I got from Iris Bell when I was doing my training out in Arizona. And it's basically a 10 centimeter long line and you put a little X showing where your wellness has been over the last 30 days. And when the little X moves up, people are feeling better about their general overall well-being. Yeah. And it can be as simple as that. It takes literally 10 seconds to do and you can do it in the course of a busy clinic instead of having to administer a bunch of complicated scales that might be more common in a research or academic setting. So that's what we did. Um, a lot of what we did was actually a qualitative sort of thing. We gave them a two-page descriptive, you know, what did you think of this? What's your feedback on this part? And they would just sort of write their answers. It was a very small study, and so with the number of participants we had, it wasn't really powered enough to do um, big quantitative outcome kind of stuff. We would have to have a lot more people. How do you, how do you uh, gel together a group when they're mainly virtual? Well, when the patients are all like not sitting together, um, it's, a, it's probably a little more challenging, but not much. Honestly, I've been practicing over telemedicine almost exclusively for about the last 10 years. And what I find and what I usually tell patients is that after about the first five minutes or so, it feels sort of weird. Yeah. And then after five minutes or so, you kind of forget that I'm on the other side of the state or three states away, and so do I. And we are all like we're in the same room. And it, then the same thing happens in the groups. Um, the, one of the groups that I did when I was first piloting um, the Seven Foundations program, I had um, four um, acquaintances, friends of mine, come join and be my group. And they kept in touch afterwards. And when they finally did get together, some years later at an in-person event, it was like they were old buddies that had, you know, and they'd never actually yeah. met in person. So they really do, it's interesting how um, we humans like to connect with other people and, and even when there's a little screen between us, that seems not to be a huge barrier. Well, what advice would you have for other practitioners that maybe are doing telemedicine, like it, have never run a group, but are interested in sort of like poking around to see how they could, how they could use an online group session? I would say go for it. Honestly, that's, I, I wish that there was some kind of um, magical thing to say to make people not feel anxious, but the best way to do it is just to jump in and you'll figure it out as you go along. Uh, one of the things that I've found is that patients who are motivated and have attached or bonded to you in whatever way really will put up with an awful lot, which is, you know, and, and bless them for it. Yeah. You know, the technology is a little weird. Something goes wrong with the scheduling. Something isn't quite right. And people will generally roll with it as long as you're flexible and you take it with a grain of salt, which you really do need to do if you're doing telemed at all because we're so reliant on you know, the power not going out, the internet going, not going out, your computer not yeah. going blue screen on you. And those things do happen. And as long as you're able to kind of roll with that stuff, the patients will just kind of follow your lead. And now that we're in a non-CME environment and you're a bit of a, a techie, <laughs> what are some of your favorite techie tools that you've used to run and organize these groups? I'm, I'm a really big fan of the, I think it's now called G Suite, it used to be Google Apps. Yeah. Um, it's really inexpensive for one provider, it's like five or six bucks a month, mm -hmm. and you get um, HIPAA compliant email and HIPAA forms and um, documents, and so that my new patient form is actually on there. You do have to request the business associate agreement from Google, but they give it to you and it doesn't cost any extra, okay. and it's really, really convenient. So that's pretty awesome. Um, Having an electronic fax software is really nice. I really like Zoom for video conferencing. I've been using them since, um, I used to joke, I always thought it was just two guys in their garage like doing this thing. Now they're obviously a huge corporate yeah. force. But whenever I, when I first, first started with them ages ago, I would email them, it would be, it would be the same guy emailing me back. And so I assumed it was just him and his buddy creating this really awesome video conference yeah. program. I don't know if that's true or not. That was the story that I always made up. Well, if you go to San Francisco, <laughs> you'll see enough billboards with Zoom everywhere. Seriously, it's a huge, no, huge organization. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, thank you for being on the cutting edge. I know that uh, you know necessity is sometimes the mother of invention. And ultimately, we've heard that again and again uh, from practitioners who have sort of got on the cutting edge of group visits. It's just like, 
let's just see what happens when we, we put this together. And so thank you for being on the, on the cutting edge. And I hope that many other practitioners who are watching, you know, take this opportunity to, you know, show how we can use technology and we can use community to really create a much higher standard of care uh, for chronic illness in, in psychiatry, all the specialties and mm -hmm. all the way through care. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks so Absolutely. much for being such a great uh, member of the Practice Accelerator and uh, really appreciate you. Thanks so much for watching The Functional Forum. I hope that you leave this episode as inspired as I am leaving this conference. You know, it has been incredible to see just what the potential is for us to be able to deliver functional and integrated medicine to the underserved through group visits. And ultimately, I think that this is how we regain our moral authority. You know, for an operating system of medicine to get people healthy off medication and to create self-efficacy in humans, that is a moral authority over the standard of care. And yet we have lost that because we have focused on delivering it mainly for cash, mainly to rich people. And ultimately, this is how we get it back. So I hope at the very least, this is starting some conversations in your household or in your community about how we can bring this to more people. It's been a pleasure to bring this to you. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.